we are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Bill Witherup. Bill Witherup is a local poet, performance artist, playwright, Hanford Downwinder, and artist in residence with Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. He is the co-editor of the anthology Words from the House of the Dead, Prison Writings from Soledad, and he is the author of numerous books, including Bixby Creek and Four from Kentucky, Black Ash, Orange Fire, Collected Poems, 1959 to 1985, Men at Work, and Downwind, Downriver, New and Selected Poems. Well, we are going to start out, you are going to read us a piece from Eugene V. Debs' Reader to get things rolling. Yeah, it's a way of uh, warming up my voice. And um, it's the first paragraph from his article, The Martyred Apostles of Labor, published in the New Time in 1898. And I thought this was appropriate to our times and also a way of leading into what I'm going to read and talk about this morning. The martyred apostles of labor, he's talking about the uh, execution of the Haymarket uh, rioters in 1886 in Chicago, in which eight anarchists were hung for having somebody threw a bomb in the crowd, and, and lo and behold, a policeman is killed, and whenever a policeman is killed, you know how that goes. So they, they executed these people without... Uh, really evidence of their involvement in the situation. The century now closing is luminous with great achievements. In every department of human endeavor, marvelous progress has been made. By the magic of the machine, which sprang from the inventive genius of man, wealth has been created in fabulous abundance. But, alas, this wealth instead of blessing the race, has been the means of enslaving it. The few have come in possession of all, and the many have been reduced to the extremity of living by permission. Close quote. And uh, the reason I chose that was to connect, in my mind, uh, my various projects and concerns and one might ask, how does this connect with Hanford and the making of the atomic bombs, uh, which I'll be talking about this morning. In my mind, it was the secrecy behind the uh, creation of the Manhattan Project that really put the national security state in high gear. And so, compressing history, uh, my connections with Hanford, where my father worked, and my current uh, project, the Gene Debs Labor Ensemble, and also being artist in residence uh, for Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility, involved with uh, my friend Stephen Gilbert's Healthy World Theater, are all of a piece. And so that's kind of the lead in to take it away, Mike. So you spent a lot of your early years at Hanford because your, your father worked there at the Hanford Engineering Works. Actually, Hanford was the uh, facility, uh, the town where most of the workers lived in was, was Richland, Washington. Some of the workers lived in Pasco and, and some in, in, in Kennewick, which is now known as the Tri-Cities. But Richland was the community, essentially an old farm town, uh, rebuilt to house the workers from the Manhattan Project. And when you were grown up there, what was it like? I mean, you, for one thing, you never really knew what your dad did. No, um, we came out from Kansas City in 1944, and, and my father, um, I was nine years old, and my siblings were younger, and my father uh, went to work at B Reactor, and I only found out this, which was the first nuclear reactor, I only found out this later in life, after he'd retired, and his job was, uh, his first job was to help in quality control and um, checking in the um, graphite blocks that were, went into the um, B reactor uh, itself. And then he was a, uh, worked as a timekeeper, and then later on he was trained as an operating engineer 
to work inside what they called the uh, um, the Queen Marys, where they processed the uh, plutonium with a mix of chemicals and into separated the plutonium out into these little pucks. So, but I didn't know that when I was younger because um, if your parents worked at Hanford, mother or father, um, they were not allowed to talk about their work. It was highly secret, very controlled. It was a secret society, but to those of us who lived in the community, it was a very normal life, except there were no black people or uh, Hispanics or we were all uh, white, white folks. And that was a kind of deliberate on the part of General Leslie Groves. It's a long story to try to compress into a into the morning, but... Yeah, you had mentioned to me earlier the only time you ever saw people of color was during the baseball games. Or the football games when we played the Pasco Bulldogs. And uh, they were that was prior to uh, the influx of Hispanic uh, workers in, in Pasco. And, um, and the first uh, black construction worker I met was uh, in the summer of 53 when I worked at the Hanford Project as a laborer just for the summer. But yeah, so it was uh, essentially an all-white community. But we found it, we thought it was very normal. And yet there was a, a sense of secrecy there. Didn't you guys used to get visited by military security people every oh, six yeah, months? Oh yeah, well, the, um, the uh, uh, military intelligence come around and uh, talk to your neighbors about your father or mother. And of course, we as children didn't know that. And so it was... Um, I talk about that somewhat in my uh, little personal essay called Mother Witherup's Top Secret Cherry Pie, which is in uh, my collection, Men at Work, and also in the uh, collection, uh, Learning to Glow a Nuclear Reader. And I talk about the uh, the secrecy. Of course, we as children, we didn't know that, you know, we just, and but everybody in the community was very on alert about, you know, the, uh, about, you didn't tell secrets about you didn't tell about you didn't talk about your work or if the uh, higher ups found out that you were talking about your work the moving van was at your door the next day and you were out of there so it was a, it was very it was really a government government town sort of like the old coal mining government towns you know it was a company town from the get go and it still is in a way so was there a sense of, as a child, did you have a sense of fear about any of that, or was it just no, this no, idyllic no, life? No, 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 it was an idyllic life. It was sort of like Huck Finn on the Mississippi, you know, because it was it was a wonderful environment to grow up in and uh, for kids, you know, and, and there wasn't really a sense of class because everybody dressed the same, you know, and and uh, although there was a class structure. And so, you know, it was, it was, the, it was the West, it was... It was Indians, it was uh, the Wild West Cowboys, it was, uh, it was just really exciting to, you know, I learned to swim in the Columbia River, <laughs> you know. And, um, <clears throat> so it was a kind of idyllic life, and we used to, um, sad to say, we used to uh, rifle the Indian uh, burial grounds along the river. We didn't know any better, looking for beads and arrowheads and so on and so forth. So it was uh, a really historical an exciting place to grow up. Still, I love the uh, I love the environment over there. As radioactive as it is, I mean the uh, the the river before it became all dammed up and into a lake was just a wonderful place to be a young man and young woman, I guess. And so it wasn't until later, as you became an adult, that you started putting two and two together. Oh yes, because it was it was a very closed society. You, you never heard from pulpit or school any criticism of the Hanford Project. Um, it, so you, only later in life as I became more politically aware, you know, and uh, and began to write and think more about um, nuclear war and, and so on and so forth. Uh, did I become aware of uh, the incredible history of Hanford? I guess I might uh, jump to a, just to a poem that kind of expresses uh, um, the. 
Well, I, I guess first I'll start with um, reading, working two poems about my father's work at Hanford. Uh, he, he later, after he retired, he, he got a prostate cancer, which eventually um, became bone cancer. And so uh, I'll, I'll work in these two poems. This is from the collection Downwind Down River. My father dying, 1984. He hums with prostate cancer, carried plutonium home in his underwear. Ashes of Trinity, ashes of Nagasaki. For Christ's sake, Dad, you went to work daily out of love and duty. But did the devil's job. You guys stoked hell's ovens brought home shadows in your lunch boxes. All the discarded radiation badges did not monitor how much your children love you or measure 30 years of labor smoldering in your work pants or count the sperm spitting across centuries, igniting everywhere karmic fire. My father, of course, was patriotic until his uh, day of his death. And he, he, you know, believed in the mission of Hanford, as many who still live there do. They, they all believed that uh, their involvement with creating, um, especially the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki, which was plutonium-fueled, they believed in the mythology that it helped end the Second World War. And... Also, that it helped fend off the Russians during the Cold War. So he was he was patriotic until you know until uh, the day of his death. And uh, when I heard my father was dying, I was working in Petaluma as a warehouseman in a pesticide company that uh, delivered uh, fertilizers and pesticides. I'm sorry to say, and and so my mother. Uh, said, come home if you want to see your father. And so we had hospice. So I drove all the way in my Volkswagen without brakes from uh, Petaluma, California, to spend some time with my father. And, and this is the poem uh, about his death. Uh, it ends with an image about trains. Uh, and this goes back to in, in Kansas City, my father used to take me down to the roundhouse to uh, see the trains turn around. Uh, and also we came out on the train, so trains have a connection to the poem and to the image here. Mervyn Clyde Witherup, born July 14, 1910, died May 12, 1988. Nearing the end, father was all bones and pain. The tumor had eaten him down to the rind. Yet little he complained or whined, Sulfate of morphine eased him somewhat, and he kept his mind and wit, though talking was difficult. A dry wind off the volcanic desert went through each of his rooms, snuffing out cells, left an alkaloid crust on his tongue. We stood by with sponge on a stick when he was assaulted by thirst and images. Give me your hand, he said, and lead me to the water cooler. I've been up in the sky. I'm very tired. Then, irritated with us, he would ask to be left alone. He would suck a sponge and grab the lifting bar, be off again, brachiating from cloud to cloud. Is there a station nearby? How do we get out of here? You'll have to help me, son. He died on graveyard shift. The train came for him at 3 a.m., when he ran to catch it, he was out of breath. Um, my father, as did many of the workers, and most of them were young when they when they came to work at Hanford. Either they had uh, did not serve in World War II due to some physical problem, or they came there after World War II, and they were all young people. And my father, as did most of the other workers, worked shift work all his life, which. Uh, which, as you know, um, has a wear and tear on your physiology. 
you know, five days of swings, five days of days, and then you had to they call a long change, and then five days of a graveyard. So, you know, that takes your takes toll on your uh, on your on your body. So he was in the uh, involved with the conversion of the yellow cake to plutonium pucks. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what they in the in the uh, these, uh, these huge canyons, which they uh, which they after they took the um, irradiated uh, rods o- over to the um, and then they would uh, add some there were toxic chemicals or corrosive chemicals and it was a very one of the most toxic places to live was actually more toxic than working in the reactor itself because you were also working around all these uh, these are corrosive chemicals as well as um, the plutonium slurry and so although they worked behind windows you know with these uh, automatic um, arms and so forth and hands and they wore these paper paper suits and booties you know uh, stuff gets into your system you know as it does into the prostate in my father's case so yeah you know, it's a highly toxic place and it still is <laughs> yeah so much of that now resides in those uh, i mean a lot resides in the tanks the what is it 140 something multi million gallon tanks that are leaking into the columbia river yeah there's a there's a new book out called uh, Atomic Wastelands, isn't that it, Stephen? Which talks about the uh, difficulty of the cleanup. It's a really complicated process, and and so a lot of that's filtering into the water table, into the Columbia River, and uh, into all the uh, things that grow and feed on, uh, you know, on on uh, plants and so on. So it's uh, it's still there in the environment. And B reactor, which your father worked at, they're currently looking at turning into. I believe they've made a decision to turn it into a museum, a historical site. Right, a national monument. Uh, it's sort of like making Dachau a national monument. Well, I guess you can visit Dachau or Belsen, and um, uh, I guess it's been about oh maybe eight or nine or ten years ago that I. Visited Hanford with um, WPSR and some some uh, scientists from uh, and and educators from um, Chelyabinsk, Russia, and and as we went uh, toward the uh, situation, it just was very overwhelming to me because it was it was just a lot of death out there. You just sense the death that you know of uh, humans and animals. It's really a graveyard. So I, uh, I'll segue to a, a recent poem, which is in my current manuscript, uh, The Poet is Hornet. Uh, B Reactor, Hanford, a National Monument. Wind gusting down the Columbia and scouring the scablands is filled with the moaning voices of Nagasaki dead. A mutant dragonfly sips a chemical cocktail from a dank cooling pond. Coyote has a tumor on his tongue, and magpies blind see her hopping in circles, dragging her wings and once saucy tail. Grave, mausoleum, sarcophagus, I search for a new word to name my loathing and disgust for what will now amuse gaping tourists. As well as the... B reactor there being turned into a monument locally here at the University of Washington. They're looking at converting the former reactor that was on campus there to, I believe, a positive history, a, a positive in, uh, uh, <laughs> maybe I'm not uh, saying that right, a, um, a history of what actually went down from, from let's say, the downwinders and, as opposed to the company town view of what went down at uh, Hanford. Yeah, this, this is a project... Um, um, Conceived by my friend um, Stephen uh, Stephen Gilbert, who is also currently president of uh, uh, Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility, and his idea uh, is to have have it be a uh, try to have a national peace museum, I guess you could say, which really 
tells the true story of what went on at Hanford, including um, comments from workers who are still living and so on and so forth. So uh, it's a big project to think about. But there is a Hanford Science Museum over there, but it's it's very uh, it's very narrow in concept, and it's so pro so pro Hanford and the mythology of uh, having developed the atomic bomb that it's really one sided. So you have also in your poetry have written about a lot of things as well as the current war that is raging in Iraq. I'm wondering if you can do a, a short reading on that. Yeah, as I was talking with you about the other day, breakfast, uh, most poets start out writing love poems, you know, uh, unrequited love. You have a crush on somebody. and See, as I did, you start out as a romantic. And then later on, I, as I got older, I kind of reversed the uh, usual character development as I got more radical as I got older rather than more conservative. So I'll, I'll just read a little uh, a, a poem about uh, my... Uh, Attitude toward the Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, and Rice is the title of it. Again, this is from the uh, my manuscript in progress, The Poet is Hornet. And uh, this is taken from an idea of the uh, Zarathustrians. Uh, uh, Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Rice. At death... The four murderers will not go to the house of songs. Oil and blood on their sleeves, vomit over their expensive shoes. The four liars will stagger toward the realm of darkness and separation, where they must listen for 10,000 lifetimes to the screams of Iraqi children. That's sort of my... One of my poems in uh, Screeds Against the Iraq War and Against the Murderers Who um, Caused It. And glad they're on their way out. <laughs> I hope uh, with the election of Obama that we'll, we'll have a more peaceful world. In addition to your poetry, you are also a playwright. You have many uh, irons in the fire. I have too many irons in the fire. <laughs> yeah, I get, uh, and my computer just crashed. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, I've written uh, several plays, uh, and also my uh, friend Stephen Gilbert has commissioned a play on uh, pesticide drift uh, from his book on uh, uh, toxicology. So I've been working on a play about pesticide drift in the Yakima Valley among agricultural workers, and it, the title of it is La Cucaracha, and uh, it's become a really sprawling Elizabethan uh, uh, block-long mural play, which I'm trying to tidy up. <laughs> and I want to uh, mention briefly your Eugene Debs labor ensemble, because I see that as very inspiring and not getting the uh, attention it deserves. Yeah, well, uh, in short, uh, oh, three or four years ago, I became interested in the history of Eugene V. Debs, and the more I read about him, the more I, I got inspired by him, and I started working on a play about Debs, which is another sprawling, unfinished play I have in, in the works. And then a couple of years ago, I decided, since it's hard to get plays produced, uh, well, I'll form my own, uh, my own theater group, and so I formed the Gene Debs Labor Ensemble, which is a for-profit small business with no capital. <laughs> and uh, my, my hope and ambition is to build a Eugene V. Debs labor, uh, labor Center in Seattle, Washington. It's an ambition and hope that uh, may never be realized, but it keeps me off the streets and out of trouble. All right, and I know you have a, a website in addition to your books www.debslaborensemble.org. It's okay, debslaborensemble.org. It's, it's all one, all one, uh, enjambed word. And 
It's called Bringing Theater to the Working Class. So. All right. I'm looking for um, George Soros or, or somebody to uh, fund my project. We have uh, just a few minutes left. I'm wondering if we have time for you to read us one more poem. Okay, well, here's um, John Wayne, Gunslinger, Rest in Peace, from uh, Downwind Down River. It talks about uh, having grown up along the Columbia River on White Bluffs and John Wayne having been, you know, the mythological Western conservative. John Wayne, Gunslinger, Rest in Peace. John Wayne, gunslinger, pranced out from the white city on the hill. At White Bluffs, way out west, partner, Alpha, Beta, and Gamma charged back and forth, whooping it up, having a great time. Cayuses hoofing chalky dust. The Braves mooned John, pissed off the clip, waggled their dicks at him. We have your wives, we have your sons. What are you going to do, Whitey? Wayne was cool, unflinching a face one wears before big evil. The moment his gelding's forelegs spliced into the icy, fast-flowing river, a pitchy to me arrow thunked smack into the wet brain of our hero gunslinger John Wayne. Uh, John Wayne died of cancer from having been around nuclear tests during one of his filmings. It was okay to say those two words on air. I think we, I think we can get away with that one. Okay. Talking with Bill Witherup, he's a local poet, performance artist, playwright, Hanford Downwinder, and artist in residence with Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. And uh, Bill, again, what was your uh, website? Yeah, it's www.debslaborensemble.org. It's all one word, bringing theater to the working class. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. I wanted to thank you very much for spending time with us this morning. 